I'm gonna say something controversial. I think a lot of VCs, you actually turned down term sheets. It really meant a lot to me to make sure we had the right investors on board. You are Silicon Valley, born and bred, and yet you never actually had aspirations to become an entrepreneur. When you're surrounded by tech, my first instinct was to run in the opposite direction. The realization that we can use technology to better people's lives. How do we think about wealth differently? How do we think about culture differently? If you got 110 million migrants, it's a pretty big market, it's good business to serve them well. I actually had this crisis of conscience where I thought, what am I doing here? It's a story that honestly is already becoming such a recurring theme on this podcast. I want really filthy effing rich women. My next guest is the co-founder and CEO of Bloom Money, a fintech startup that supports migrant communities with the mission of accelerating intergenerational wealth. Bloom Money is also two times regulated and backed by the likes of January Ventures, Octopus, and Pact VC. Nina Mohanty, who joins us here today, bucks the trend as a young female brown entrepreneur who has backing by top venture capitalists and operating in both the finance and technology fields. Nina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Like, I'm very, I'm buzzing. You're ready. You're ready <laughs> I'm to so escape excited. out your chair. I I'm wearing my, my bloom trousers. For those that can't see, they've got flowers on. Paint us a picture. So yeah, yeah if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Yes. Nina is very on brand with her flowery <laughs> trousers, which I love. This time of year is nice to get and a pop of color, an injection of springtime. Nina, look, I was absolutely spoiled for choice with the amount of accolades and achievements oh. in oh. your intro there. I feel like I couldn't squeeze in any more. Did you just win another award last night as well? The company won an award. <laughs> so we are very humble. Yes, Altfi's FinTech for Good of the Year for 2023. Thank you. It's surreal. Yeah. We didn't expect to win. No one was actually <laughs> at the awards. Not because we didn't expect to win, because actually it was too important, really too busy, expensive. Um, but yes, really <laughs> delighted. Uh, that that's, that's like the ultimate like power move, isn't it? Like winning an award, Make, and you're uh, not even there to receive it. I'm so sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> I've got other no. plans. Yeah. No, congratulations. Honestly, it's been amazing and I cannot wait to get stuck in with you today. So first of all, let's rewind the clock. Obviously, a bit of an accent. You were literally born in the same place that startup, even the term startup was born. You are Silicon Valley, born and bred. Mm -hmm. And yet you never actually had aspirations to become an entrepreneur. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Yes, I was uh, born and raised in the Silicon Valley in a tiny town south of San Francisco. And it's funny because I grew up during, uh, well, following the dot-com boom and then the crash, the burst of the bubble. And my parents were dot-com boom engineers. And so naturally, when you're surrounded by tech, my first instinct was to run in the opposite direction <laughs> of tech. That does make sense. Yes. Um, so I'm born and bred. Uh, whenever I go home, people are like, oh, are you fundraising? I'm like, no, I'm just seeing my mom. <laughs> But yes, I'm from the Silicon Valley. People do live there. <laughs> I love that. And I know that, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And as a quick sort of, you know, recap of your career, I know that you started out working for the US government under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. You then went into corporate finance after doing a master's in management and then scale up life with Bud and Klarna before setting up your own startup. Mm -hmm. I know that that wasn't part of the grand master plan. No. So what was your guiding light throughout each of those steps in your career path? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I've just joked that I ran away from tech. I'm actually a massive tech skeptic, which has made the past week really interesting. For context, the whole open AI firing, rehiring of Sam Altman and all that and uh, effective altruism and all of this in, in Silicon Valley. But I'm a tech skeptic, I think, because I grew up around it. Mm. And I've always believed that government is the most powerful. So I actually joined uh, the Obama administration because I believe that we could be more impactful from that perspective. And I think that's probably the common thread is this desire to serve others. Uh, I think the people that know me 
best know that I want to maximize my impact and help others wherever I can, even if it's one person on a single day, then that's great. And so that's probably the common thread. I think I found government to be intensely rewarding, but very bureaucratic <laughs> uh, and slow. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> yes, yes. Something I wish I had realized or even considered earlier. Um, and then I think ending up in fintech was a pure accident. I fell into it is, is often the wording that I use because I never planned to enter it. People ask me today, how did you get into it? And I just say, I fell into it. But I think the spark was the realization that we can use technology to better people's lives. Mm. And that's what I saw when I was at MasterCard. That's what the mission was when I was at Starling Bank and launching that um, as part of the team at Starling Bank. And everything since has really fo followed there, which is how can financial services be better mm. for the average person? Mm. It's so refreshing to hear that that's been your mission. That's been the common thread throughout all of these different fascinating phases of your career, because it's almost like in recent years, we've lost sight of the mission of entrepreneurship, like truly, like beyond mm. the buzzwords. It's exactly as you say, it's wanting to serve, it's wanting to make that impact, mm. it's wanting to leverage technology for good. There have been so many bad players and people get into the into the game for the completely wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So your voice is not only so important to be heard because of your demographic profile and everything that you've managed mm. to achieve, but for these, these fundamentals as well, which is fantastic. <sighs> Shucks, you're making, me, you're making me blush. <laughs> Your head isn't going to get out the door now. No, but it is. It's like we've we've lost sight of that. So so I think that's that's amazing. So coming back to the mission that you are solving at Bloom, I know that this is something that's been really close to your heart for a very long time. Even back in high school, mm. I saw that you were part of the Indian Awareness Club. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. you've really done your research. <laughs> wow. I've, uh, I've got my magnifying glass out. Oh, I've God. done my, my snooping. It shed some light on just how bad the problem is for the people you're trying to help with Bloom. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think um, I was speaking to our CMO the other day and she is French by birth, but ethnically half Martiniquez, half Moroccan. Uh, so just like me, she's kind of mixed race, uh, immigrant child. And we were talking about the fact that we are actually the global majority. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was, I've heard that phrase kind of bandied around and I've never really felt comfortable using it. I think because my entire upbringing has mostly been in the West. Mm. My professional career has been in the West where I'm actually a minority. And it was the startling revelation, I think, when I was doing my master's degree, I was chatting with a woman and I was saying how when I was in high school, I really wanted to be blonde and blue eyed. Oh my God, same. Yeah, I just was like, I want to be mm. um, 90210 and I want to be like running on the beach. I that's, still want that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, same. But like, as a California girl, that's what people think of. And they don't necessarily think of me being a California girl. And I told her how that's what I wanted. And she grew up in Delhi. Uh, she's Indian and her family has been in India for as long as, she, you know, she can remember. And she said, I always knew I was beautiful. I always knew that there was nothing wrong with me because everything around her, everyone around her looked like her. Everyone mm -hmm. had the same skin tone. And like, there's obviously, India has its own issues and caste and lots of things to discuss, but it kind of was a very startling realization. And that ties into this whole idea of the global majority. Mm. Increasingly, uh, people from global majority cultures are coming to the Western world. And they're trying to create better lives for themselves. Oftentimes, they're trying to create better lives for the rest of us. Mm. I mean, if you look at the NHS workforce, they are just, I mean, immigrants are mostly the nurses, the doctors that are in the NHS yeah. these days. Our transport is mostly run by immigrants. Like, it's it's mad um, the number of people who are, are choosing to come to the West to build their lives. Um, and the weird thing is, the one thing that we give to them is remittances, send money home. Okay, that's great. Like, but what about everything else? How do we help people live a holistic life 
where they are? How do we think about wealth differently? How do we think about culture differently? Even though they're far from home, how do we make far from home feel like home? You know? So that's, that's kind of been the common thing. And I think to go back to high school and the Indian Awareness Club, a lot of this has to do with identity as well. I've probably spoken less openly about that myself because I'm half Taiwanese, half Indian, raised in Silicon Valley. So I'm very much what people would call a third culture kid. And to this day, I don't really know how to introduce myself. Am I American? Am I Indian Taiwanese American? Am I Asian? Am I a, a Silicon Valley transplant? What am I? And I think we're all searching for identity and we're all trying to be authentically ourselves wherever we are. And that's something that I think wasn't being addressed from a financial services lens, which is what led me to where we are now. Mm, I love that because I know that during your time in finance, you saw the way that you phrased it was everyone's building for the same type of person. Mm. So I think that really does speak to even just like diversity in teams in terms of like your mm. staff because another forgive you know the stereotype but another like middle-aged white man <laughs> would come in and it's a fish in water type syndrome right mm -hmm. like you wouldn't even recognize you just go along with it yeah whereas somebody like you that's come from this really diverse background mm. different country suddenly these things stick out to you it's like the everyday sexism you know all these th things that you see as a woman that men is just like not even on their radar right mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I feel like this is an obvious one, but given that there are, it feels like today, especially there are so many wrongs to right in this world. <laughs> yes. I feel like, you know, you need to pick your battles. And so the, you know, sticking with the mission of Bloom still, mm. is this the one particular battle you've chosen to fight because it's got more of that personal identity piece to you? Or is there something that's deeper that's really making you want to mm. fight for this injustice? That is a really difficult question to answer and a very good question because I am often, <laughs> I feel obligated to try and fix every wrong in the world. Right. I think many of us do. We see injustice, many of us, and we want to right it somehow. I, you know, as an American that's pretty outspoken about a woman's right to her body, for example, when um, the Supreme Court overturned Dobbs recently, I actually had this crisis of conscience where I thought, what am I doing here? Like, I need to move home. I need to pack it up. I need to go campaign or fundraise for Planned Parenthood or run for office or, I don't know, like do something in the U.S. that is useful for this particular cause. I also, um, actually a lot of, of my journey leading to Bloom was doing a lot of work with refugees here in Europe. Um, actually, during the pandemic, before I started Bloom, I was actually going to go live in Moria in Greece, which is one of the islands where there's a, a very large refugee camp. Um, there's so many different things that I feel so strongly about. Like we could talk about, you know, access to menstrual health for girls and women in India, like everything. I want to solve everything. I want to help everything. But I think to your point, you have to start somewhere. And actually, I was speaking to one of our angel investors who is also American and living here in London. And we were specifically talk talking about uh, Dobbs and, and the case of abortion. And should I move home? What do I do? I feel guilty. I feel, how can I be here when so many women have just lost rights over their body? And she said, yes, but Nina, there are so many people. Like, of course, if you move home, you could put your skills and expertise to great work. But there are already people on the ground who have been working at this for so long. And if you want to help, you can donate, you can write letters, all that stuff. You don't have to move home because there aren't that many Ninas who can build Bloom. There aren't that many people who understand the problem you're trying to solve, who have seen the intersection of migration and financial services and the injustice there mm. within the financial system there's not many of you running around mm. to build this. So this is where your skill set lies. And this is where you should spend your energy at this moment in time. So I think, yes, there are a multitude of things that I care 
deeply about and try to support however I can. Anyone that follows me on Instagram knows I'm like social justice warrior, like keyboard warrior, always bringing things to light. But I think the combination of my lived experience as an immigrant child, as an immigrant myself, my experience building fintech products, my experience of realizing that the financial system, especially speaking specifically of retail banking, is not fit for purpose. These things make it such that, you know, this is my chosen path. And who knows, maybe it'll change one day. But for now, um, this is the flag I'm flying. That is a wonderful answer to indeed a very difficult question. So well <laughs> yep. done on handling that one. And I love that because, of course, you combine any sense of activism with entrepreneurialism, which often, you know, they can get kind of muddled because obviously as an entrepreneur, you want to solve a problem. You see something that needs to be fixed and you want to go for it. But the key takeaway there for our listeners, I think, is what is your unique skill set whether it's your lived experience, your professional experience, your areas of interest and passion, because as you say, the the list of problems we could solve is seemingly endless. Is endless. endless. So you've got it. You've got to start somewhere. Mm. So with that in mind, how do you balance? I know that one of your biggest pet peeves is hustle culture, which we'll come on to. So that's <laughs> that's a slightly slightly different sort of shade, but. With, with this injustice, with this fight in mind, how do you balance the burden of the fight mm. w- alongside taking care of yourself in more of that kind of mental kind of way? Yeah. Because while you think about the answers, because again, I know I'm hitting you with the hard Yeah, no, <laughs> these are brilliant questions. questions. Because the re- where, where I'm coming from is I used to be much more vocal about gender inequality and I found myself kind of getting worn out by you because you've kind of got to get yourself revved up and you know the more you read about the inequality and the injustice the more wound up you get and mm-hmm. then you know it's you do want to fuel that energy and that passion into mm-hmm. social media and conversation and, and moving things along but but it can be draining after a while yeah and it can be hard to keep going at it yeah. so how do you balance that so actually a big part of it, um, we've got a lot of intersecting things for me. Obviously, I'm a woman of color building a venture-backed business. So that in itself is like boom, 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 yeah. triple. Um, and then who we're building it for, in, it starts to become a very complex maze to try and find your way through. I think the first thing that I sadly had to do was actually pull back from a lot of the pro bono work that I do with refugees. Um, That was actually devastating to me. And I still do quite a bit of work, but at a more macro level. So I used to literally go and help asylum seekers with their cases, um, try and help them find jobs or find accommodation, et cetera. Uh, And now I'm more on the advisory side where I like, for example, advise an organization called Talent Beyond Boundaries and help their refugee candidates find bank accounts. And I kind of, not lobby is not the right word, but I get the word out to a lot of the challenger banks and high street banks that there are these very worthy folks that are coming over, working for the NHS oftentimes, who have employment contracts that can't get access to bank accounts, for example. So I had to bring myself further out and zoom out a bit mm. to become a bit detached yeah, from it makes because sense. it can be really devastating yeah. at a micro level. Mm. Um, the second thing is, I, I, I mean, paradoxically to that is when you're trying to build something that is venture backed, you want massive scale and you start to talk about things in these massive numbers, right? So we talk about like the purchasing power of immigrants in the UK is 118 billion pounds estimated. And you're like, okay, great. That's like a large number. Fantastic. Or, you know, I've, I've done every type of modeling of every financial service and it's like billions, trillions, like, oh, wow, big, massive numbers. And we're talking about like the marketing expenditure that we're going to use to hit this many customers and blah, blah, blah. And this valuation at this, whatever, how much you've raised at what valuation, these are all in the millions. And 
it gets to the point where you get very out of touch with why you're doing it. Mm. So, uh, yeah, rather paradoxically, I've had to pull away from my day to day of actually working with asylum seekers. And yet, um, I try to do this every week. Nowadays, it's a lot harder. At least once a month, I do what we in the team call feet on the street. And I live in Lewisham, so it's really easy for me to do feet on the street because it's a very immigrant heavy area. But I will literally go out to Lewisham High Street, to the market there, go to Peckham High Street or Peckham Rye Road and just chat with people uh, and walk up and down, chat to aunties, have a cup of tea, buy someone a coffee. Um, I made a friend with a woman named Rose who's incredible. She works at one of the tube stations as a cleaner and took her to coffee and just asked her about her life and heard her life story about uh, immigrating from Ghana to Germany, then to the UK and her entire story of how she now over the span of 30 years, now she's very proud of her like pension pot and her ISA. And it, you know, it's little things like that where you're like, this is what we're doing it for. Yeah. I love that. This is why we, we take the shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, you can have that story. Yeah. Um, and that's really fulfilling to me. I even have a giant sticky note above my laptop at home or like my whole, you know, set up with all my screens and it says like, if you're feeling frustrated, feet on the street. And that's what I do. If I'm just like having a bad day, you get some rejections from a VC, whatever. Mm. They're telling you, I don't get it. I don't think this customer exists. You go out and you just speak to someone. Mm. There's no way they can gaslight you because you're hearing it straight from the yeah, person's mouth, right? I love that. Staying close to the actual the actual problem. Mm. I was used from a marketing perspective, I was used to say, you know, the large part of the word in marketing people seem to forget which is market and I don't believe we get out there enough and just mm. talk to people and it's interesting you say about you know there's huge stats in the pitch deck that can I get the paradox that you described there because look at how huge this problem is but actually like 118 billion or whatever it's like mm. what does that actually mean it takes away that level of impact and resonance mm. when you're talking on like such huge scales but going and having a cup of coffee with rose as yeah. you put it is like super impactful so staying with that impact piece i'm curious as to how much being such a mission-led business has mm. helped support your success again more from a marketing side of things because again it's another buzzword but like every other startup today has to have like that purpose and whatever yeah but obviously your mission is so baked into the dna of mm. the product of what you're doing so does that help kind of propel word of mouth and it's interesting because within the tech ecosystem within the vc ecosystem it has become very a la mode to talk about esg impact whatever and I think that I'm going to say something controversial. I think a lot of VCs use that wording and don't actually know what they mean by it. I think they think that LPs maybe care. Maybe they think it sounds good, that it will attract interesting founders. Fine. And probably all of those things are true. But I think a lot of the folks who call themselves impact investors or impact funds do not actually care that much about impact at the end of the day and like sorry if I'm bursting anyone's bubble but venture capital is the purest form of capitalism it is like capitalism unchained right and the whole reason it exists is to get outsized returns and so I think that's a really difficult thing to balance from a theoretical perspective of impact because you could impact a single person's life and that mm. could be impact yeah but doing it at scale is very different that's not to say that this doesn't exist i i have a lot of respect for companies like um gojek in indonesia or paytm in india or any number of businesses tala that's kind of operating in emerging markets i do think that they're impact businesses that have the potential for outsized vc returns it has been helpful for us, I guess, because we can attract attention from funds that do care. 
And so we kind of tick a lot more boxes now. Um, and I think some people find it unfair as well. They're like, oh, you can speak to the female focused funds and I can't because I'm a man. I'm like, well, sweetheart, <laughs> the rest of them are male focused funds. So <laughs> actually let us have this one, please. Um, or, you know, like whatever emerging market funds or what it doesn't really matter. Mm. It's funny that it's ironic. We won this award FinTech for good and I'm very proud to have won it, but it was never our intention to be titled as a fintech for good mm. we're just a fintech company mm. it just so happens that we are our mission is to do good for people i think every fintech should be doing good <laughs> for people <laughs> what do you mean fintech for good like i think the the issue i have with that branding is like we're gonna give you a stamp this one's fintech for good so does that mean everyone else is fintech for bad <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> what are we saying it's here? Like you're implying the default. Is. Exactly. You're That's like, so funny. we're not saying it out loud. Yeah. This is the unspoken bit. <laughs> so um, it's it's been really interesting. Our customers, though, interestingly, they they don't view us as a fintech for good. Yeah. They don't view us as an impact thing. They're like, you're serving me and my life. You're I solving didn't... a problem of mine. Exactly. Mm, that's what it comes down to. I think what which, what rubs me the wrong way is people who think that this is a charitable thing. Um, and I think sometimes people equate fintech for good as charitable or tech for good as charitable when really it's just good business. Mm. If you've got 110 million migrants across Europe, like right. it's a pretty big market. It's good business to serve them well. Right. So that is my approach to it. I hope I haven't really hurt anyone's heart by these truth I'm bombs that I'm sure you haven't. And if you have, they're the sort of people that need to wake up and need to hear it. Anyway, yeah, exactly. so I really wouldn't worry about it. So you mentioned fundraising and mm. VCs. So my next question is, Nina, what makes you think that you can build a billion dollar company? Oh, God. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, the reason I mentioned that for the listeners is because shockingly in this day and age, you still got asked that question and you still got asked all of those um Misled, misled, misguided kind of questions from VCs. Um, so I know that during your fundraising process, you actually turned down mm. term sheets in order to prioritize having women on your cap table, having people of color, having immigrants. So massive kudos to you for that Thank as well. You. I think as much as what you're doing with Bloom is so admirable, what you're doing in terms of being a profile for other younger women of ethnic minorities or however you want to mm. phrase it. But something like this, mm. where when it actually comes down to it, like who you're taking money from and who you're making rich to turn down, like you're seriously putting your money where your mouth is. So major kudos to you for that. Because that, that is truly impressive. So what I'm curious about is the fundraising process is tough enough, <laughs> like just to begin with, like with whatever, like, yeah. um, and obviously the past kind of year, couple of years, it's been even more difficult than usual. Mm. Did this prioritization of a different type of investor profile add another la layer of difficulty into an already tricky process? <sighs> yes and no. Um, I probably could have closed our funding round in less than three months if I had just taken the term sheets that we were offered. And bish bash bosh, done. It really meant a lot to me to make sure we had the right investors on board. And I'm very proud of the fact that over 70% by volume of our round was written by female partners or female check writers, that over half are first or second generation immigrants, that over half are people of color. Um, that was very, very important to me. And it's, you know what's funny is it was a lot easier to do raising our first round than it is now. Uh, obviously the macroeconomic situation has changed, making it such that now it's like, you take the money wherever it comes from. <laughs> Um, currently, but I think when it was just me and I was fundraising, I wasn't paying myself. I was living off my savings and 
raising that first round, the stakes are much lower. I was actually speaking to one of my mentors, um, Romy, who's the founder of Pension B, just a week ago. And she, <laughs> we were sat at the Pension B offices and she was saying, Nina, it doesn't get easier. Like the stakes just get higher. You have more employees. You have more at stake. You have more of your customers' assets under management, et cetera. It just, the stakes keep getting higher. And so this time around, you know, would I love to be picky and be like, I'm only taking women's checks and like women of color and immigrants only. And, you know, it's, it becomes harder over time, especially I think the later stage you get, mm. the, ca the caliber, the quality of the capital pretty much is identical because of who is allocating that money further down. Um, it has been very interesting though because it has opened a lot of new doors for us. So I had a really delightful conversation with an angel investor today who is from West Africa and she has worked her way up the ranks in banking for decades now, very senior woman and because she herself is an immigrant and she recognizes the behaviors that we're building for, the quality of the conversation was just so different. Another level. I it was imagine. just, it wasn't, we went from, you know, sometimes I pitch folks and I'm having to justify that immigrants exist, <laughs> like it's full ridiculous. stop across Europe. They're like, I've never met an immigrant before. And you're like, you live in London. What are you talking about? <laughs> but with them, it's like, Oh, okay, so tell me about building trust within the fact that there are different tribes from this one country. So how, and that, that is the conversation you I want to be having. You get to leapfrog over all the basics and the education and immigrants actually exist. They have the, and you actually get to like. Have a conversation. <laughs> oh gosh, it was, it's beautiful. And what's been even more exciting about it is because these folks come from the communities we which, from which we want to serve they have been our number one champions. Mm. So maybe they're not able to put in a few hundred thousand. Maybe it's a few thousand, you know, in a roll up in an angel ticket, but they're the ones that are first to jump. And when I send investor updates, which I send monthly, I always have an ask section. And it's like, ask, we're trying to reach out to the West African community. We have an idea about barber shops and hair salons. like. If you have thoughts, let me know. One of our investors was like, literally was like, I'm going to put you in touch with my loctician. Boom, like straight in. One woman was getting her braids done. Mm. She called me while she was getting her braids done on one of our angel investors and was like, speak to the woman who's braiding my hair literally <laughs> right now. It was brilliant because like, they're the ones that Instantly are connected. right there. Who you need to speak to. Exactly. Yeah. So it's unlocked so many doors, opened my eyes to so many more interesting behaviors and ways and I mean, it's interesting because there is the parallel between your core value proposition at Bloom and going back to what you were saying before around like, it just makes good business sense. So, you mm. know, as much as we're winning these FinTech for Good Awards. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very, I'm very, very proud, by the way. Sure, I'm not sure. snubbing my nose at it, yeah. <laughs> but as you say, it's like, well, actually, like there is a case for it. There is this whole big market size. The same applies on that investor side of things. As much as I'm giving you kudos and recognizing that you've prioritized women, immigrants, people of color, actually here what you've just described again is like, it's just good business. Like these people are connected directly to these communities we need to, to speak to. Mm -hmm. I just want to expand a bit more on your, I love, I love, 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 one of your other more personal missions, again, sticking with the kind of investor theme is to make women filthy rich is yep. how you, you worded it specifically, which I love. So just expand a little bit more on the thought process on why it was so important for you to prioritize women. So besides what we've just spoken about, you've got all those benefits of being connected to these communities mm. and stuff. But I guess from that more feminist kind of standpoint, yeah. stopping and thinking about who you're taking that money from, just kind of elaborate a little bit more on that whole process and how you're going about making women get filthy rich. So that quote is actually borrowed from the brilliant Cindy Gallup, who's the founder of Make Love Not Porn. And I believe I heard her say this for the first time on my friend Emily's podcast, The Wallet. And she's her exact words, and I'll I'll censor myself, was 
I want really filthy effing rich women. <laughs> and I borrowed that and I was like, that is brilliant because same. Uh, and I now, oftentimes when I talk about things, I get invited to speak on some really strange panels, which I love. But when I was talking about like pensions and I was like, I want to be a rich granny. I want to be like a rich auntie and a rich granny. And I want other rich aunties and rich grannies out there. The reason I want there to be rich women out there, filthy rich women, is because one, women already worldwide already control the purses of their households. We already know this. All of the data bears it out. There is a reason why Tala lends disproportionately to women emerging markets because they are militant about keeping the money safe. There's a reason why benefits across the world are often paid to mothers and not to fathers because mothers tend to look after the sons a bit more. Um, and so we already know that women are actually very good with money, contrary to everything the media tries to tell us about women. And the other thing is what women choose to do with their money. I think the perfect example is Mackenzie Scott, formerly known as Mackenzie Scott Bezos, the ex of Jeff Bezos. Uh, she's a billionaire in her own right, I might add, because she really put the team on her back early days at Amazon. And the types of things, I mean, you've never seen a woman so eager to get rid of her money. She's just like giving it away to causes that matter. Meanwhile, and I don't know how like PG-13 or R-rated we can be on this podcast, but like you've got male billionaires who are in like a dick swinging competition, like I'm going to get to space first or I'm going to go see the Titanic. And you're like, but uh, why? <laughs> For what reason? You know, and it, it, it boggles my mind sometimes the priorities that we, we have um, and the priorities that rich people have. And with women largely, I mean, one woman that I really admire is Dame Stephanie Shirley, who goes by Steve. Um, she's like one of the first British female billionaires. And so much of her money has been used to fund um, autism research and um, creating homes for children with autism. And it's just things that actually benefit society and make it a more pleasant place for all of us to live. So I think the things that women do with their money are really interesting, good for the world. I think women manage money well. And frankly, if we have more filthy rich women, that creates a virtuous cycle. We see, um, we're starting to see actually a lot of, in my vertical with FinTech, we're seeing a lot of exits um, you know, you, I, know, I think, you know, Emmy Faust, you know, like she's an exited founder. She's writing a lot of angel tickets and whether or not, I mean, you can have a big argument about whether it's right or not, but so many of the exited founders in our ecosystem are male. And so for better or for worse, they're going to invest in what they know and they're going to pattern match to what they know, which is going to likely be male. So if we have more filthy rich women, women who are exiting their businesses, then, you know, chances are they're going to invest in things that they know, mm. right? And invest in women and invest in an opportunity that they know exists or a problem that they have felt acutely and want to have fixed that maybe men don't understand. So this is why I want filthy rich women I also look forward to an early retirement, <laughs> inshallah, we'll see one day. <laughs> Nina, you're absolutely making my heart expand. I love this. I'm totally here for it. And, you know, you're obviously extremely deserving of all the success that you write. It's very hard for. But, you know, I mentioned as part of your intro, you're bucking the trend just in terms of your profile and the space that you're in, but also how you're going about your investment strategy by mm. hopefully making the women on your cap table <laughs> touch wood <laughs> it's it's all going in the right direction so i'm i'm so thankful to you honestly we need more we need more women like you quick one this is future steph coming to you from beyond if you're enjoying this episode then you can probably guess what i want you to do please do me one tiny favor that costs you nothing and takes a second of your time hit that subscribe button. It really helps to support the show. And I'm really grateful for you listening. Let's get back into it.
So sticking with the practical advice I mentioned earlier that your biggest pet peeve is like hustle culture, entrepreneurship. Mm. If mm. you're listening and not watching to this podcast, Nina just did the biggest eye roll of the century. <laughs> the biggest <laughs> sigh ever. As a startup founder, mm. are there some really like practical tips or boundaries that you've put in place? Is there anything that you do in terms of your own physical, mental wellness mm. to help you to avoid falling into that hustle culture trap? Yeah, I think one, find find an activity where you're not on your phone or connected to a screen. Uh, for me, that's two things. One, working out. Uh, I'm really into hit classes. So I go to One Rebel here in the UK. And that is 45 minutes where it's, you you literally cannot check your phone. You're just on a treadmill being bullied by this fitness instructor who looks like Adonis. And my brain just shuts off. And it's just like about surviving that 45 minutes. So you cannot think about anything else. Uh, the other is the theater. You cannot, it would be rude to be on your phone in a theater, right? So it's like the phone is away. You are engaged in it. It's not like TV where you're sat there and scrolling at the same time. Double screening it. Find something where you have to turn off. Um, the second is you cannot pour from an empty cup. And as founders, there's no point in me telling like telling you work-life balance, like self-care, blah, blah, blah. Like at the end of the day, we all work our asses off. There's a reason that we chose this lifestyle. And remember, you chose to be a founder. So just keep in mind that if you are burnt out, that's going to manifest in very awful ways oftentimes. You're probably going to be shorter and curter with your team. You're probably going to make poor decisions. You're not going to be thinking through things at the peak of your ability. So you cannot give if your cup is empty. It's the whole put your mask on first before you help someone else. Mm. However you need to get there, do that. Mm. If it's a spa weekend, if it's going on a long walk, if it's your dog, cuddles, whatever. Do what you need to do, but <laughs> replenish your cup. I think there's a mindset shift there. And I remember hearing about how it's shifting from self-care. Uh, maybe this is more of a gendered thing as well. Perhaps maybe this is more helpful to the, to the women listeners here, but mm. is actually thinking of yourself as the director of the company as kind of divorcing yourself yeah. from, you know, that closeness and having, I get that mindset shift of I'm actually taking care of the greatest asset, one of the greatest assets of the company. That's such a good show. So it's almost, so again, you know, you could do all these things, but if you don't have that understanding and that comfort mm. within yourself, that deeper mindset to go and do a hit workout or cuddles with your dog or whatever, then like, I know that is something that can be, Quite, that's actually really good. quite helpful because I think there's that servitude there's that wanting to help others and it's just like if I had to take care of the CEO of the company how would I manage her diary how would I yes right what food would I be giving her absolutely what would be the workouts yeah. and it's interesting to compare and contrast mm. that kind of shift manage your life like you would manage your best friends yeah I love that that's so cute yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay penultimate question the next two are going to be fairly quick fire. Yep. I have to ask this next one. What was it like meeting Michelle Obama? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. One, she's really tall. She's really tall. Her arms are so toned. <laughs> she's so graceful. It was like meeting a human swan. I don't know. I was just like, <laughs> and the thing is, I've met celebrities before. I've been in the same room as Anna Wintour and Kim Kardashian before. Don't ask why. And... <laughs> It was like, whatever, these are people. But with her, I was completely awestruck. I could not speak. It was just like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, I think I managed to get out. Like, please, can I have a hug? I think is what I said, but I was mortified. Um, and it was just, you know, she was just saying hello to the embassy staff and like shaking hands and giving hugs. But so this was during your time it, working for the US it embassy, was. Right? Okay, yeah. And she's just so gracious and so intelligent and like, wow. I want her to adopt me. <laughs> is that weird? <laughs> She's amazing. So this is definitely not a not meet your hero type of thing, right? No, she's, no, no. She's incredible. That's yeah. amazing. Oh my God, I'm so jealous. And then the final question, what we always end our podcast episodes with mm. is um, often the best lessons can come from the biggest mistakes. Obviously, this show is called Strategy and Tragedy mm. for a reason. You've had all this amazing success. There's all this stuff that's happened. 
has there been any tragedy that you've experienced during mm. your time at Bloom, particularly that's really taught you something that you'll never forget? I think, um, gosh, there's there's so many lows. I, uh, the biggest tragedy is currently ongoing for me and that's my health. I think this is why I'm talking about make sure that you're not pouring from an empty cup. I've had several months of just like really touch and go health issues. I've never been so grateful for the NHS. I've never been so grateful for what health I do have. And it was that start, yeah, very stark realization that I am constantly running on fumes. I'm burnt out all the time. And when I am, I have no motivation. I can't, I can't run a business. I can't fundraise. I can't do any of that. And it was this realization because actually to divulge some more information, I actually collapsed and that's what kind of kicked it off. And collapsing in public outside Covent Garden is like the worst possible thing that you want to happen to you. And it was the scariest thing because as you say, this is one of your business's biggest assets. You don't want anything bad to happen to her and here I was going, what was this, the series of decisions that led this to happening? So it's something that's really reshifted my priorities, mm. made me think very clearly about uh, the way that we work, the way that I manage myself and my time. And it's meant that I've had to be, you know, a bit standoffish with people, a bit colder and or say, can we, you know, circle back? Because really I'm just, physically healing as well just don't have it in you yeah I'm, so I'm glad that you well obviously I'm not glad that you have but I'm glad that you shared that because mm -hmm. that instance you just described there I think so many people have been through similar kind of thing where you just think you can keep going you can keep going and you know you survive off a bit less sleep or you skip a meal and you're like oh you can keep going but actually suddenly you might have a collapse or an attack and it's a story that honestly is already becoming such a recurring theme on this podcast yeah it's crazy like I don't think I ask leading questions yeah <laughs> not unless I intend to and it's something that without that provocation it comes up time and time and time again and you know what also health does not discriminate this affects brown women white men it doesn't yeah. matter who you are everyone you've got to take care of of this basic human package that we've been that we've been put in. Yeah. Nina, thank you so much. I feel like thank I could you. go on for much longer. We probably will after the camera starts. <laughs> <probably. laughs> yes, but absolutely. There are many, many more questions I'd love to ask you, but we'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. This was such a joy. And thank you so much for listening. Please hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out and stay tuned for the next episode.